Hello, good evening. How are you, How are you doing today, folks? My name is Hamid Omar, the host of the Child Justice Factor. And as usual, we're always testing things out to see what it is that we can do to give you experience. So we're testing out a new software tonight. So bear with us if things don't go like they usually do, not as smooth as they usually do. So um, tonight I have a very great guest on. Her name is Aya Haynes. Aya is a historian and the founder of Plain Tree Collective. But before we go, I want to test a little something and see if it works. So we will be right back. I'm very fine. You're welcome. Glad, glad to be on You're here. Welcome to Just Banter. Your first time of coming on. Your first time of actually experiencing what it is that we do on here. And I hope you do have fun with us tonight. Indeed. I'm looking forward to it. So, quite a lot of stuff has been happening in recent times. And uh, a lot of it has been centered around the issue of racism, the issue of um, hyper descent, so many stuff. The Black Lives Matter, you know, movement started from George Floyd being you know, killed by a policeman in the United States. Prior to that, a lot of people have been talking about what they call institutional racism. You know, in Western countries, the United States, in England, all over. And for so many people, it was a case of Africans have a history. Why do Africans or why are Africans forced to migrate out of Africa? Why are Africans supposedly subservient when it comes to other races? What exactly or why or how did our history go missing? Why did our history go missing? Well, that's a very detailed question, but it's, it's to cut a long story short because it's convenient. It was convenient in many ways for African people in general to not know their history, to not know their power, their past, because then it made us easier to control when we stepped out of our um, of our continent, when we were then taken into other arenas, when we went to Europe, when we went to the Americas and so on. Um, so in many ways, African history was written out purposely because it made the conqueror's job easier. It made the conqueror's job easier. Now, before... We, we had um, the Portuguese and the Germans and, and then eventually the British coming to the shores of Africa. A lot had been going on. We had some massive, fantastic kingdoms. We had the Songhai, you had the Zulu. Zulu, I think, is it the Zulu nation? Yes, Shaka indeed. Zulu, Shaka Zulu that everybody knows, hears about and all of that. You had the likes of Mansa Musa. The man who caused inflation, you know, on his way to the Hajj, you know. Is, yeah. An inflation that lasted 10 years and brought Africa back onto the map because of the amount of gold he spent on his Hajj, indeed. So the, the average African should have a lot of dignity. So, but for a lot of them, it's not happening. Now, I read a book very recently, um, something to do with the missing manuscripts, you know, in uh, Timbuktu. A lot of families actually were holding on to a lot of those manuscripts. They were actually hiding those manuscripts because they do not want those manuscripts to go missing. So you've had manuscripts that have been with some families for 400, 500 years, and you know, it was actually hidden in a well, securely wrapped in something, protected, and then dropped inside the water and held by a string yeah. so that nobody can have access to it. They were able to get a couple of families on board to actually agree to release some of those manuscripts and those manuscripts were taken back to South Africa, to an institute in South Africa, to actually be, you know, translated and all of that because they're written in ancient languages. Now, for most people, they still don't have access to that type of history. But for you, you will do some fantastic work with the Flame Tree Collective telling us a lot of history. I mean, I did history and you still know so, so much more than I do. What can you tell us about those type of manuscripts, where our history is hidden and all of that? 
So I think the manuscripts of Timbuktu in, their, in themselves are such a unique and a special volume of work because it gives us a unique written insight into African history told by Africans from that time period. Because when you look at a lot of our medieval, our ancient history, it's written by Europeans, by Arabs, by people from other continents, other places. And so no matter what it is, as an outsider, you will always have a different perspective than somebody who comes from within that culture, within that community. And so when we look at the manuscripts of Timbuktu, they tell us what it was like to be an African living in Mali in that time period. We it talks about things like recipes. You learn about, um, you know, the transactions between um, traders, as well as the religious texts as well. Um, written in a language that we still understand and use frequently today, Arabic, but also some of those documents written in the traditional African languages using the Arabic script. So in that sense, it is such an amazing volume of work. Um, and as I said, because most of our history isn't written down in Africa, we have a tradition of passing our history down in story form. So usually it's sitting around the fireplace, you know, in the evening, or it's sitting under a tree with your grandparents. And this is how our stories, this is how our history is passed down traditionally. Um, but in Timbuktu, we have this unique moment in time when our history was written down in huge amounts of work. Um, the fact that it's been preserved is a freak of nature because, you know, the fact that there have been many wars that have gone through that region over time. There was actually a time when one of the kings who conquered Timbuktu actually was against the university and many manuscripts were um, destroyed at that point in time. And that was the first time that they were taken and hidden by the families. And then it happened again after the university sort of went to an end. And even more recently in history, when we had the jihad movement that came in again, wanting to destroy some of those manuscripts, many families still managed to preserve it. So luckily, people, even without understanding what's written in the books, understand the importance of preserving these books. And this is why we still have them today. Okay. Hold our thoughts. One second. I'll be right back. Okay. This is what happens when you're doing new stuff. You get a bit disorganized and all of that. But um, we will give. Now, apparently, it seems like we're not connected to Facebook and YouTube. So um, while we're talking, I think I'll just try and connect and see. Do you have your Facebook on? No. Do I need oh, to put it on? I'm just going to send you an invite to just turn that on. Okay. Um, let's just Let's just continue. What we'll do is we'll just follow and just repost the video again. So we don't have to stop. We don't stop. Now, recently, okay. a, um, the president of Haiti was killed, was assassinated. And the history of Haiti came, you know, under the spotlight all over again. The first colony to actually gain independence. The first black colony to be self ruled the first black nation to actually defeat the then superpowers of the world, France, uh, France, Spain, and the British as well. But that country has never truly been, you know, on course, so to speak. They've always had short termism when it comes to leadership. The average times, the average lifespan of any leader that goes, you know, that ascends, you know, the position of power in that country is about two years, except probably the yeah. Papa Doc Duvalier and his son, Baby Doc Duvalier, 
who collectively spent about you know, close to 30 years. Now, they were revered because they were practicing the traditional African religions. A lot of people feared them. There's a lot of co-relationship between the traditional African religions and the history of Africa in itself. How did traditional African religion become disjointed from our history? Do you have any idea how? There's a wonderful saying that says, when the white man arrived in Africa, we had the land and they had the book. And when he left, we had the book and they had the land or something yeah. along those lines. But it's that whole idea of we had something of value. We had a, a knowledge of who we were. We had a pride in who we were. And when Europeans came with colonial, colonialization, with imperialism, they undermined that you know, core belief in who we were. And they told us that your ways are not great. Your ways are inadequate, are barbaric, are ancient. You must come to our side, you know, follow our religion, follow our ways, our traditions. And by the time we opened our eyes and realized, hang on, this change has happened, the power shift had occurred. And so for us, most many of us Africans, it's the case of you don't then value who you are because you feel that who you are is perhaps not as good as yeah. they are. And that's one of the great, con you know, cons of the world. Um, and unfortunately, that has led to many of the issues that we face on the continent, even till today. Um, but definitely the fact that um, Haiti had that strong link with voodoo, um, which is in itself derived from the traditional Ifa religion and, and so on, um, is what helped the revolution in the first place. Because it was that strong focus on the fact that they kept the traditions alive. They used voodoo as a way of preserving their um, sense of who they were. So although on the plantations on the Sunday they went to church with the masters, they still went in the evenings to the you know, voodoo ceremonies and kept that link. And that was how they were able to even organize the revolution, by holding these meetings and working together um, from that sense. Again, you mentioned the Duvaliers. Their control over Haiti was because of how they tapped into the belief in voodoo. So when we look at the fact that we, what we have our African links still intricately bind us, even though we might not understand it, um, those links are there. So whether it's language, whether it's culture, whether it's tradition or religion, these are the things that still call us, still bring us together. These are the stories of our childhood, the stories of our past that sort of ring down through to us. Um, and so Haiti is a wonderful example, you know. Yes, it was the very first um, island, the first country that not just had a revolution or a revolt, but successfully managed to push out the European powers and keep power. And if they had been left to their own devices, they would probably have been a very successful nation. But because the whole thought of white supremacy and superiority was there within Europe at that time, especially within the Americas mm -hmm. at that time, they could not have the fact that there was this black ex-slave community that was now thriving. Because remember, Haiti at the time was one of the most profitable islands in terms of the goods that came from there. So you had you know, the sugar plantations, cotton, tobacco, and so on. Um, at one point, one in every eight people in metropolitan France, their income was derived in some way from goods that came from Haiti, from that economy and that industry. So you can see how important it was, you know, in the grander global sense. Um, but when Haiti decided to take that power back and say, you know what, we are going to rule ourselves. We are going to do this well. And already they had managed to do this in sense of mobilizing troops kicking out and resisting the Europeans and setting up a government and their own colony, their own um, community, they had such a great foundation to be able to do more, but this was not going to be allowed. And so they were, they were blocked with um, the French insisting they had to pay repatriations. The, um, the fact that most Western countries refused to trade with Haiti. And so therefore their economy was sort of cut at the root. If you haven't got money coming in, if you haven't got connections, you're not going to be successful. 
And then you have also other governments coming in and infiltrating their politics, making sure that there was always that era of instability, because again, if you have an unstable government, it's a lot easier for you to sort of get on with what you want to do in the background. So that's sort of a very complex picture, but it just goes to show again how, you know, if we're not careful, it's very easy to look at the surface and say, oh, you know, they should have done so much better. You know, they, how come they haven't achieved much? How come they're still the poorest country in the Americas? Um, could they not have done more? Well, actually, they could have if they were not undermined every step of the way. So when you speak about them being undermined and the strategy that's you know, been employed forever against Haiti, you now have to now look at the relationship between that and Africa, especially when you look at... You know, I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in a series of events. So when you look at the strategy that mm. France used against Haiti, it seems very similar to what they used against the colonies in Africa, the French in Africa. Exactly. Now, in a book called The Art of War, it says there that the person that creates the chaos is the only person that can actually see clearly within that chaos. So you now see yes. a lot of French, former French colonies, Neocolonialism is still there. But former French colonies who have never been able, you know, to actually get their economies going. Everything they do is to the French system. They have never really truly been able to get back, you know, their true sense of identity, except for probably maybe a country like the Republic, where if you go, you know, to the uh, Republic, especially during the summer, you see that there are a lot of festivals that take place there. And those festivals are related to the traditional religion and all of that. And they do have national holidays for those traditional religions. So, or well, those traditional ceremonies, right? So it seems more a case of they are trying, they've been trying very hard to keep their identity in that country. But all the other, you know, French colonies, they, they, they don't even have a central bank. All their money is warehoused in France. So mm. it's been a case of continuous suppression. But there's still a school of thought that says there's no such thing as institutionalized racism. Is that true? Um, of course not. Institutionalized racism has always been there um, from when the race was created. Because when you look back through history, race is actually quite a modern concept. You know, through time, you've always had people in terms of different tribes. So you were, you were Chinese, you were Indian, you were, but you know, Norse, you were um, Celtic, you were Malian, you were Malinke, you know, whatever it was, our tribes were how we identified. And it didn't matter the color of your skin, because I think people understood even at that time that actually your color of skin did not matter. It was more your cultural identity and your tribal identity and links. And that was how people identified themselves. And then there was that shift in time when suddenly race became um, very important. And it was to do with the birth of the slave trade, the, Af the transatlantic slave trade, um, specifically because people had to almost justify the inhumane treatments that they were putting out to Africans who were being taken from their homes. And the only way they could sort of you know, make themselves feel better was to say, well, they're not quite on our level. Well, they're a different race anyway. And by making those excuses and creating this thought that actually we have different races, we have one race, we're the human yeah. race. You know, if you look at us in, in terms of um, people, you know, melanin, melanin is skin deep. So you have people who are very light, very dark. Within families, you get throwbacks coming generations down the line where you have a white family and then there'll be some a child who looks mixed race or who comes out quite dark skinned. Again, vice versa, you'll have an African family who will then end up with a child with blondish hair or green eyes. So these throwbacks always happen because we as humans have always mixed through time. I mean, Looking at myself as well, I'm half English, half Nigerian. Um, growing up in Nigeria, for me, my identity has always been more grounded in my African yeah. background. Um, but I also have cousins within my own family, exactly the same sort of English-Nigerian mix, who grew up within the UK system. And their grounding is much more within the British setting, because 
you as you accept and you assimilate what you grow up around what you're used to so in terms of institutional racism that kind of came about as a way of making sure that those in power remained in power and the only way you can do this is to make sure that the masses um never unite against you you know if you want to look at the american setting when they first had um the um system of slavery within the americas it was not a black white thing they had irish slaves they had slaves from the first nations they had slaves from the caribbean the caribbean tribes who were taken as well as well as the africans who were brought to, um from africa so there was a mix of people who were within this subclass of being enslaved and it was nothing to do with the color of your skin and then you had a, a few revolts where people got together and said we're not tolerating this anymore we're not taking you know the treatment anymore and they rose up against the ruling classes and were almost successful in some yeah. instances and this was when the powers that be went right we cannot take this and they then used the color of your skin as a way to further divide people so suddenly the irish and the europeans who had been in that setting of being enslaved or as indentured servants were now told you're still beneath us but you are above them and so that sense of superiority was then put into people and it became divided not on class but on color of skin or but on race and that i think was part of where institutional racism really sort of became ingrained within sort of the modern world so, but for a lot of people you know they don't know the difference when it comes to race so as far as they are concerned it's either you're caucasian you're black you're hispanic and all that how do you define race? How do I define yes. race? In the context of what you just explained we have now. One race. I believe we have one race, the human race, but we have subsets within it. You have, you know, people who live within a certain area who have um, physical adaptations that suit their climate. Yeah. You know, so Africans within Africa developed natural, you know, darker skin, more melanin to, you know, protect themselves from the sun, from the African sun. You have the Mongols and people within, you know, North, um, Northern Asia who have very broad and very flat noses, again, protecting them against the winds, the harsh, harsh winds on the, in the Gobi Desert and on the plains of Mongolia. You have um, people who are quite tall and lanky, again, those sort of different adaptations suit the environment. If you even want to go down to genetic levels, when you look at our blood, within the African context, many people have heard about sickle cell um, and the fact that if you are AS, you know, you carry the trait for sickle cell, but not the disease. Well, actually that adaptation, that mutation for the AS is biology's way, our body's way of protecting us against malaria because people who are AS are less likely to suffer from malaria you know badly they might have it but not as intense as if you were aa so from a natural point of view our genetics our biology went you know we will sacrifice the odd ss we don't mind the aa but we're actually aiming for the as within this sort of west african context because this is a malaria prevalence zone and so you get these sort of adaptations within different people groups some of them you can see on the skin some are you know further down within us um, that you can say are down to the constructs of race. But even when they look at the fact that they studied like skull shapes to say, okay, this particular skull, these features are only from an African or are only from a Caucasian and so on. They studied very small numbers of skulls. They didn't do massive, massive um, a, a numbers of research there in order to make a very wide um, decision. And so we take what they say as, yeah, this is what they did the study, they did the research, it must be true. But actually you look back on it and they didn't look at hundreds and thousands of people to compare. And if you do look at people now, you will find exactly the same skull shapes within different, you know, sorry, different skull shapes within the same sort of ethnic group. Just showing that at the end of it, we are just all human, which is kind of where I look at it. We are the human race, but we have the nuances of our culture and our unique sort of placement in in the world. Okay, viewers, uh, I've had quite a few 
extra, extra intelligent people come on the show and we've had some beautiful conversations. I think I ranks among one of the top few, don't you think? What do you think? No, I don't. The way the way you actually are able to break things down is very insightful. You're a great teacher. You have the flame tree collected, and I actually was privileged to be able to watch one of your of the presentations. There were several things that I noticed in the course of watching that presentation. One of it is what you've just exhibited right now. Your ability to break down things in such a way that even a five-year-old would understand. Now, I'll now go back to the African history in itself. At that session, you were talking about the likes of uh, the Shaka Zulu and quite a few things that people didn't know. How they were able to raise their own civilization, how they were able to stabilize, have their own systems of government and things like that. We also know that in Benin back then, you also had something similar as well. Now, how come, if we look at it from the context of the level of development as of that time, for Africa and for Europe, how were the Europeans able to take Africa 300 years backwards? Well, so it comes down to almost the perfect storm. Okay, so when we look at African history overall, over time, or rather when you look at history in itself over time, every civilization has a moment in time when it rises and then it falls again. You can look at that in terms of um, the Romans, you can look at that in terms of the Chinese, you can look at that in terms of African civilizations, and some will even say that at the moment, perhaps we are reaching the pinnacle of our own civilization as a sort of Western world, and that is starting to shift towards a different trend. That's a story for another day. The, um, the sun is beginning to set on the empire. The sun is setting on our empire, indeed. But when we look at the African context in itself, you have the fact that through time, especially within the medieval period. So you're looking at sort of from about 1200 to about 16, 1700s. There were these African empires, African kingdoms across the continent, you know, north, east, west, south. You had kingdoms with a proper political, economic, social structure. You had them with control of a vast populations, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people in some instances who were living under very orderly societies, who had systems of rule that were suited to their traditions, again, and their culture. And these are the, these are the kingdoms that when the Europeans first arrived, so we're looking the 1400s, 1500s, with the arrival of the Portuguese traders, with the first arrival of, um, you know, the, the um, Boer settlers down in South Africa, and things like that. When those first Europeans arrived on the coast of Africa, especially let's just look at just West Africa in itself, they didn't come to find people who were living in trees, like we're told. They didn't come to find people who were at the, you know, coming, who were living in bare basic um, societies. They found very complex societies. They came in contact with the Dahomey Kingdom. You know, you've got the Dahomey female warriors, the Mino warriors who were known as the Amazonians. And that, that social structure there where they, they had an army, the king had an army of over 5,000 women soldiers who had such level of skill, they were able to hold the French at bay for many, many years. You had as well, they came in contact with the Asante kingdom. The Asantes themselves are part, a subgroup of the Khan people who are descended from the ancient Mali Empire. So when the Mali Empire came to an end, those people moved south into what is now the area of, um, of Ghana today. Um, and you have these structures that they came and they met. And when the Europeans arrived, they came in at a lower level. They said, hello, we're here to visit. We'd like to trade with you. You know, your king is in charge. He's, he's the ruler here. We will do what he wants in order to get our trade. 
And then there was this gradual shift to the Europeans slowly getting more power. Um, the fact that they were now starting to control the trade along the coast and they started to undermine the kings and the chiefs and the social structure that was there. And as they gained more of a stronghold, that destabilized some of the kingdoms. You had the growth of the slave trade. So when the, the which in itself is um, part of a wider experience that we have on both sides of the Atlantic, um, but the transatlantic slave trade in itself, because of the vast numbers of people that were being taken away from our coastline, the kingdoms who took part in the slave trade needed a constant supply of people. So they were constantly at war with their neighbors, people that they had previously traded with, you know, over the years, over time, they were now at war with. You had the fact that many kingdoms that would have recovered and continued to build themselves up we're now having to run and hide in the forest. Look at Abel Kuta. That is the city that my mom comes from. The word itself, Abel Kuta, means under the rock. And this is because at that time, the Egba people were running away from the Dahomeyan army who were needing slaves in order to trade with the Europeans. And so the Egba went and hid under the rock in order to preserve themselves and to keep themselves alive and away from the slavers. So that destabilization within the entire region led to the fall of many kingdoms. You add on to that the fact that there was already the beginnings of climate change. So the Sahara was already starting to dry and spread further south. So people were again shifting. They were becoming um, climate migrants. Um, the same like we see today, many people are moving from their traditional homes because again, the Sahara is spreading further. Um, so you put that all together and you can see why not only did many African kingdoms fall, but they were then not able to get back up. You know, look at the three main empires of West Africa. You had first the Ghana Empire, which was replaced by the Mali Empire, which was replaced by the Songhai Empire. As each one went down, the next one came up. And to be honest, if the Europeans had not arrived at that moment in time, the Songhai Empire probably would have fallen and another empire would have risen in its place. But because we had that interruption in history, that outside influence, it actually broke this natural rhythm of, of, of humanity, of um, culture that had always been there, of civilization. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the fact that we are not where we should be today, it's because Africa is still recovering from a major holocaust. There's a term called Martha, and Martha means the great disaster. I think it is, or the great terrible occurrence in Swahili. And many people refer to what happened to Af the African continent as Maafa, because so many people were taken from our shores, the young, the educated, those who were keepers of the knowledge, keepers of the skill, they were all taken away in vast numbers in a very short space of time. So they were not able to pass on their skill and their knowledge to those left behind. And you can understand then why we lost those skills or why people who would have lived in wonderful cities would have thought, I'm not going to go to a city, I'm going to be targeted there, I'm going to run and stay in a small village, I'm going to stay out of you know, off people's radar so that I can keep myself safe. Um, look at tribal marks. We have tribal marks across a lot of West Africa because people knew that if you were stolen away and taken away from your home and managed to escape, by using those tribal marks, it was almost like a roadmap to get yourself back home to say, look, you can see this mark, it tells you I'm from this village, how do I get back there? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So um, Africa, African history is so complex because there's a lot that is part of the natural rise and fall of any civilization, but there's also the fact that there's that outside impact that really sort of set up an atomic bomb in terms of our understanding of ourselves and the fact that people were trying to recover from that episode, um, but then they were not allowed to recover from it because straight on the heels of that, as soon as the slave trade sort of ended, we had the scramble for Africa. We had the whole period of colonialization. So people then were still not allowed that chance to recover. And I believe it's only now in the last few decades that we're slowly starting to understand that recovery, but only because now people are becoming more aware of that history. Because if you know what happened, if you know where we once mm -hmm. were, then you know that we can not only get back there, we can surpass it all.
So there are a lot of things, there are a lot of things that have happened in recent times that a lot of people have not really taken a deep look at. So recently I was hosting a show on cryptocurrency. A lot of people have not really looked at it and realized that. What is cryptocurrency? What is the concept of cryptocurrency? Do they even realize that cryptocurrency is the digital version of what we used to have back in Africa, back in the days? Standardization and decentralization by using carries as against gold. Yes. How come people are not immersed in history? How come history is not a very strong part of our culture anymore? What happened? Because we were specifically not taught our history because it's a way of maintaining that power over us. So if you look at the average Nigerian, when, when I went to school in Nigeria, my history started from 1960, independence, you know, and then all the coups and all the, the things that happened after that. There was that sort of rumbling of, oh, yes, we did have some kingdoms beforehand. We had the Oyo Empire. We had the Kanemborno Empire. We had King Jaja of Opobo and so on. Um, but there wasn't much focus on them. It was kind of like, yeah, 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 that doesn't really count very much because they didn't do very much. Um, and it's because the curriculum that we were taught was originally a European curriculum. So why would the Europeans want to focus on the greatness of our kings and queens? because then we would then challenge them. So it's much easier to say, yeah, you guys might have done something, but it doesn't really count. It, it was only just, you know, a few little kingdoms here and there. Well, actually, no. If you, meant, you mentioned the Benin Kingdom, the city of Benin had streetlights 200 years before streetlights appeared in London yep. and in New York. They had a form of street lighting. They had the, the, the walls of the city were polished so much that the, the adobe walls almost shone like marble. You know, and you think about it, we use adobe, they go, oh, yeah, people build with mud in Africa. Why do we build with mud in Africa? Because it is the perfect material within that environment. You know, adobe, earth, mud has the most amazing thermal regulatory properties. If you have a mud building, it's able to regulate the, the temperature within that building to the fact that no matter how hot or cold it is outside, it remains cool inside. In northern Libya, there's a city called um, Gadames, and that is an ancient Berber city where the buildings there are built out of the same adobe, the same mud buildings. 6,000 years almost. Um, you got this, not 6,000 years. I think it's about 3,000 years. Yeah. So you've got this city that's been there for so long, whereas the houses that are in there are still so comfortable to live within because people were in tune with their nature. They had over time understood this is what works best in our setting and in our environment. So when you try to bring in a different way, when we now build with concrete across Africa, yes, it's great structurally, but it doesn't do so well for the heat. So then you have to put in air conditioning. And it's about in, you know, in the sense of building, going back to those traditional techniques, in the sense of our history, going back to our history, to the fact that we had great people, we have those kings, those queens, we have those empires, that civilization that was there. Greek civilization originated in Africa. The people who went and started, um, you know, the schools in Greece studied in Alexandria at the feet of African scholars. So we sometimes forget that the impact that we have had on sort of the global understanding has always been there. It's just always been overlooked. So they're taking away most of what we have. And then they started reintroducing it back to us. So like what you just said now, now they're reintroducing it and any architect or builder that wants to sound very cerebral, very intelligent, very up to date, will say sustainable design, you know, using local materials and all of that, and then building houses in a sustainable way to save your power and all of that. They have a lot of our artifacts in museums and they tell us to pay for the euro, to pay money. So actually that euro that mm -hmm. we have to take permission when we want to do exhibitions to borrow those artifacts and then return it back to them. Most of the colonial power is built on pillage and plundering. Now when it comes to the history yes. like you said, 
they definitely won't have wanted us to be able to challenge them, so they won't have introduced our part of history, you know, into the curriculum that they were teaching. I mean, even history that's as recent as the 1957 massacre in NEB at the coal mines is not in any history books that you can find in Nigeria. I always wondered about that. So I always used to wonder, how come, you know, nobody said anything about this? But it's a bit like the Biafran yeah. War. You know, that is such a major moment in Nigerian history in particular. Um, and we should all know about it. Yet it's barely mentioned, you know, within sort of the Nigerian historical story. And yet it's one of those pivotal moments where, you know, a group of people said, you know what, we don't want to be part of this union anymore. We want to rule yeah. ourselves. And they were made to stay within the union because other powers had other intentions. Um, and that is something that we should be studying from both sides and go, right, these guys had these opinions, these guys had these opinions. When we look back on it from sort of a historical standpoint, what do you think could have happened? What do we think would the outcome have been if it had, you know, if the Biafran movement had been successful? You know, where do we stand now that it wasn't successful? How do, these, how do we move forward from it? What are the implications to today? You know, does it still affect us? This is a conversation that we as Nigerians should be having, but it's never one that it's had because it's convenient to leave it out. Because, again, it's all about controlling the masses. If people don't have these sort of dialogues, these deliberations, then they're not going to understand the depth of what is there. And they can't, they can't question the powers. They go, right, this is what it's supposed to be. This is what we do. Okay, no problem. I'll go along with it, you know? Nigeria in its sense is, um, as much as I love my country, it's almost a mistake in the sense that, you know, you had three, and I'm talking the three main tribes, because I know there, you know, hundred, you know, over 250, 300 different tr tribes, languages within our country. But you have the fact that these three main sort of ethnic groups, the Northern, the Eastern, the Southwest, were, would, if they had divided themselves, would have probably formed into three countries or communities. And yet, because of British colonial decision, they ended up merged into one. And yet, even within the colonial system, the way the North was governed and ruled was very different from how the South was governed and ruled, and was still bearing the sort of political scars of that difference in rule, even till today. You look at the fact that um, in the North, it was a lot easier for the British to rule by a system of indirect rule because you had the Sokoto Caliphate. Now, the Sokoto Caliphate spread across the whole of northern Nigeria. It actually went from northern Cameroon all the way across to Burkina Faso. And this was a system where everybody within that caliphate was subservient to the, the um, sultan, the sultan of Sokoto. And so the sultan just had to give one instruction and everybody did it. All the emirs were, you know, subservient to him. So it was very easy for the British to come in and take over the top. And then that way they had control of the masses. Whereas when you look at the, the Igbos, the Igbos don't have that system of a Sultan and Oba. They have a more sort of egalitarian democratic yeah. setup where everybody, every man in the village is able to come within the circle of elders, speak his mind, say his point, and then they decide all together what the decision is going to be moving forward. Now that group of people are a lot less a lot more difficult to rule because how do you then convince everybody? You can't only convince one person, you have to convince everybody in order to get your way. And then you look at the Yorubas who had almost a mix between the two. You have within the Oyo Empire, the Alafin. Now the Alafin was the king, he was the supreme ruler, but he was held in check by the Oyo Messi, right? The Oyo Messi was the Yorubas parliament. So the king, the same like we have in the UK, you've got the queen, but she still, you know, takes on board the decisions of parliament. It was the same within the Oyo Empire. You have the fact that if the Alafin didn't do what they wanted, he was deposed by the Oyo Messi. And so again, if when the British tried to rule the Yorubas, they couldn't instantly easily control the Alafin because if they told him what to do and the Oyo Messi or the people mm -hmm. didn't like it, he got kicked out and someone else got put in. So again, that sort of system of rule had to be different to tackle the different people. But those nuances were not taken on board when we became 
independent. And we sort of said, oh, yes, we're all going to work together and do this. And because we didn't understand the fact that culturally we have very different ways of governing ourselves, and perhaps we should look at a way that this can be done that can suit all people, is, I, th I think, personally, why we have a lot of our issues in Nigeria today. So, Ayo, we could go on and on and on. And for those few who are privileged to actually be watching this right now, because we know, we realize that we have a technical problem, so we are not on live on YouTube and Facebook. I'm sure quite a few of them are mesmerized by all that you're saying. Trust me, I am. So, first things first, I'm going to say this is not over yet. This is part one, okay? <laughs> we have very little bit of time left. So, I'm just going to say this is part one of this conversation with you. We're going to have tons of it, I'm sure. But there are two things. Earlier on, you mentioned the issue of institutionalized racism and how people deny you know, that it exists. We've talked right now about system of forms of government and how colonialism has affected Nigeria as a nation. So two things. First, do you think that Nigeria should split? Historically, that is, not necessarily in today's context. Ah, that's a very difficult one. Um, historically, I think Nigeria should never have been put together. But seeing that we are together, I think we we should make it work. <laughs> I don't think um, we would necessarily benefit from a split at this point in our history. Because I don't think we are stable enough to survive as three thriving nations if we were to split. Because I think if there was a split, it would be a three-way split. You know, okay, well, I think it's going to be much, much, much more. Much, much more. What I would have, what I would have asked anybody, honorary would have been, do you think that as Africans, we should develop our own systems of government? Because it seems that democracy doesn't seem to be working for Africans. Democracy doesn't work for Africans because democracy is not an African thing, for one. But also, where we have managed to work democratically and been successful, those lovely powers that be have come back in and undermined it. You look at Burkina Faso, right, when we have Thomas Sankara. Now, this was a man who came in and said, look at my nation. We're getting rid of the French. We're going to govern ourselves. They became independent. And within four years, the amount of change and innovation that this man brought to his country. He brought female rights forward. He brought education for all. He set up infrastructure. He created a, a government that was, that was actually on the way to being incredibly successful within the African setting because he took the best of both worlds. He took African traditions and, move, and the ways we do things and merged it with what he'd learned from European government. So, but then, they didn't want him to succeed, so he was assassinated. Now, some would say he was assassinated by his friend, but then who paid his friend off to do it? You know, and there's a, there's a theory that it was actually the French who got his best friend. They had grown up as brothers and had gotten him, of all people, to, you know, create that Julius Caesar movement where he was the one who instigated the assassination of Sankara, which then plunged Burkina Faso back into where they are today. Um, and this we see across the African continent. You can look at Gaddafi, very much a Marmite character. Many people think he's the devil incarnate. Some people think he was the best thing. Yes. Gaddafi was a great ruler for the Libyan people, yes. but he was not great for the Western world. So he was, cre uh, this sort of demon figure was created for him as a way to undermine the good that he was doing within his country. So sometimes we have to look at our African story and, um, and just go, you know what? There's more to it. You have to peel back the layers to understand what it is and to appreciate the fact that even something that seems very simple, it never is. So yeah, I don't think Nigeria spitting would be a great option. Um, because there's so much more that we can do together. 
if we look at the fact that the fact that it's Nigeria as a country doesn't actually matter. We are African. So whether you're Nigerian or Ghanaian or Sierra Leonean or Botswana, whatever you are, we are all African. And when we focus on that, when we can unify in that way, that is when our true strength will become apparent. So in all of this, it seems that Africans are victims. So we've been victims of mass abduction, mass slavery, genocide. The Jews, quote unquote, because they are Israelis and they are Jews. But the Jews, you know, keep going on and on and on about genocide, how they were treated the world, you know, prior to World War II and then the consequences of World War II and that. And everybody is very sensitive about anti-Semitism. But nobody seems to talk about all this forms, different forms of abuse that Africa has gone through. Now, one of the things or one of the results of that is hypodescent, which is something I'm not going to let go. I'm going to make sure I've already back on because you are also a victim of hypodescent, as I understand. Indeed. Now, for those who don't know what hyperdescent is, I'm going to quickly share what hyperdescent is on the screen for you to have a quick look so that you can have an understanding of what hyperdescent actually is. So, um, in societies that regard some races or ethnic groups of people as dominant or superior and others as subordinate or inferior, Hyperdescent refers to the automatic assignments by the dominant culture of children of a mixed union or sexual relations between members of different socioeconomic groups or ethnic groups to be to the subordinate group. The opposite practice is hyperdescent, in which children are assigned to the race that is considered, considered dominant or superior. So, now, they look at it and they say, there's no institutionalized racism. But a race has been declared to be the superior race. And if you have a drop of blood that quote unquote contaminates that superior bloodline, so to speak, you are not one of them anymore. You fall into the race that is that's determined to be the lesser race. And in a lot of cases, it's actually the black race that this happens to. How have you been able to relate with being half British, living in England, seeing the level of racism going on, and knowing that you are a victim of hyperdescent? Uh, right, so hyperdescent is sometimes also called the one drop rule, okay? And in itself, it's actually more, I think, linked with the American story. So that is where you had the fact that, again, looking back to the history of slavery, the chattel slavery that was most prevalent within the Americas, um, you had that system that in order to maintain your power, you had to say that I'm different from you. And in order to maintain that difference, you, were not going, you didn't want the races to mix. So in that sense, hypodescent or the one drop rule meant that even if you had the appearance of being completely Caucasian, if you had a great great grandparent who was African, in a sense, as you said, you were then tainted, so to speak, um, and classified as black. And that was a way for the, the white owners to maintain their sense of superiority and to maintain their control of power. Because people were then, at that time, were not allowed to vote if they were black, they were not allowed to attend schools if they were black, and so on. So by meant having this one drop rule, they were able to keep the best of the pie, so to speak, for themselves because they were not competing with many people. Now, when you look at hypo descent within other communities, within, um, say for example, the Nigerian setting, um, growing up in Nigeria, I was always called Oimbo and I hated it, absolutely hated it. So a lot of people look at Oimbo, which is the term that's used to, re um, to refer to somebody who is mixed race, sometimes called half caste, biracial. Um, and you have these different terms that are used. But for me as a child, that was particularly that word was a taunt. You know, you're walking down the street and it's Oimbo, there, there. And I used to go home and cry. <laughs> 
So, or you both pepe. Or you both pepe, that catchphrase, or you both pepe. I think it's, um, it's going to be a topic for another episode of Just Banter on its own. We'll get to that. Go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But yes, in that sense, um, for myself, I am very, very light skinned. Okay. As somebody who is half white, half black, I'm very, very pale. Um, and if I wanted to, as the word goes, pass, um, I could, if I was to have my perfect English accent on, and if I was to call myself by my English name and have my hair all straightened, very few people would know that I'm half Nigerian. And if I did not have that sense of pride, that sense of um, assurance in who I was, I know who I am, um, then perhaps that's something I might have done. Um, but from a very young age, my parents never talked about white or black. Like I was never told you are half white, half black. I was always told you're half English, half Nigerian because the focus was on my cultural duality. Okay. So the color of the skin was not an issue. Um, and although in growing up, the rest of the world then tells you, oh, why are you so light skinned? You, are you sure you're half Nigerian? Why do you speak so well? Are you sure you're half Nigerian? And it's like, how dare you? You know, Nigerians are some of the most eloquent people on the planet. So to be honest, that is my pride. Um, and I've always been proud to be both. I would never say I'm one or the other because both sides of my story have formed who I am. Um, and growing up in Nigeria, especially in a city like Kaduna, so I grew up in Kaduna, which especially in the 80s and the 90s was a very cosmopolitan, very mixed society. You had people from, to be honest, all corners of the world, cultures from all over the world, who all mixed and interacted on very equal footings. Um, and that in its sense was a very wonderful way for a child to be introduced to humanity with the fact that it didn't matter who you were, where you came from, what your parents were, we were all one in that sense. And I was always interested in people from where they came from. So I would always ask, oh, you're Polish. That's interesting. What kind of food do you eat in Poland? And you know, what, what are your stories that you tell at bedtime? And that was my sort of interest in people as opposed to, okay, you are white, you're black and so on. Um, but yes, there, there are probably advantages in the sense of how people perceive me to be. There are sometimes conversations people will have when they don't realize who I am and where I'm from. And you have to pull them up on it and go, hang on a minute, that's out of order. And that doesn't make sense. Um, but you have to do it from a way where you you leave that person with more knowledge than yeah. anger. Because if I was to come to people with that kind of conversation and say, how dare you say this, blah, 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 blah. They will get defensive and they will lock off their they're, they won't listen anymore and my message won't get through to them. But if you come at it from a way that you almost meet them at where they think they are and tell them, actually, you need to take a step up in your understanding, then you leave them at that point from going, hang on, that comment I made is completely, does not have any um, strength to it or my understanding of that person as being a certain way because of who I think they are actually doesn't make any sense. So many times when we talk about race within the work setting, within our families, within the, you know, all these issues, you know, the issue of colorism is huge across, you know, the black community in the fact that there's a lot of people who think, oh, because I'm so light, I cannot be African or I cannot yeah. understand um, the African experience. And sometimes this comes from people who have never stepped foot in Africa. You know, you have a lot of people who have that sort of sense that, this is my thing and it's only mine. But actually, my heart is in Africa. I grew up there. It has shaped me. And you cannot take that away from me. Um, well, in that we run out of time. But one quick question okay. and just a quick answer. Go need to. So how do you feel about a book at there now? <laughs> just, just, just say something. <laughs> something quick. Ten seconds. So when I was <laughs> when I was young, my mom used to tell me that I should answer them back and say "Blacky Jungle, you go Blacky Momo." Um, <laughs> but, but now, 
comes now would be, it's about that understanding with the fact that actually they weren't saying that to me to tease me. It was actually in a sense, almost a compliment. So at that time I thought I was being teased, but now I understand that it was actually a compliment. So sometimes you have to take a step back from your personal feeling about a situation, look at the wider picture, and then you understand it better. It's been great having you on tonight. Um, Thank like you I said, me. this is part one. So we are definitely going to go on to part two. Unfortunately, we had technical issues, so we're not live on Facebook and YouTube, but we're going to be posting this uh, podcast episode onto those channels. So watch out for it. And thank you so, so, so much for taking out the time to join us. You have a great night. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much.